All right, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jacob Hickman, and um, uh, I'm a member of the faculty here in the department. And uh, both Sheila, Bib, and I uh, are teaching the two separate sections of the senior thesis writing class this semester. So I guess by default we're kind of co-hosting this at some level. Uh, but we've got food, as you've noticed, so please, uh, you know, perfectly without uh, disturbing the speaker, but, you know, help yourself. We've got uh, water and some really pretty cupcakes. Uh, we'd like to welcome you all. The sort of the uh, premise here is that we're going we're gonna to try starting this uh, every semester. Um, so next semester, if we have any, do we have any dirt diggers here among us? No archaeologists? Oh. <laughs> oh, you just like to dig in the dirt. <laughs> okay, well, I know some of my archaeology students are coming. I'm a sociocultural anthropologist, by the way, but I have some archaeology students in the uh, theory class. And actually, maybe, uh, well, I don't know if we want to play that game where we scoot in, but please help those who come in at any point during, because this is a three hour symposium, so. Uh, if you do come and go, please, uh, you know, just try and do so as quietly as possible. But uh, the premise here is that uh, we're going to be trying starting this out every semester to give this, the, the students who are in the process of writing their senior thesis an opportunity to give a public oral presentation of that. Uh, so there's a schedule, and it's right there. If you didn't get one, they're right there as you walk in, uh, where uh, the food and water is and so on. By the way, silence your phones. <laughs> Somebody's calling me to remind me to silence my phone. Uh, but there's a schedule right there um, if you didn't get one. Um, so these are all the students who are in the senior thesis writing class right now, and we're going to hear about all their presentations. So uh, without uh, further ado, we'll start with uh, Pete Busher, who's, uh, and we won't introduce each person like a formal symposium, but I'll let, you, I'll let him give you his title. So. Uh, welcome everybody. Before you start, Peter, yes. look at me on the time now, see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Am I, uh, do I have six minutes an hour? No, do we will get ten minutes. We'll take it out of the break in between. Um, are we doing with this business or just arrows? Or it's up to you. So do you prefer this? Uh, Okay, so my name is Pete Busche. I went to Guernsey for my field study, and the title of my thesis is The Gradations of Growing Up on Guernsey, an anthropological study of 16 to 26 year olds. This age group is very important. Um, anyway, 16 year old, uh, the 26 year old young people on the island of Guernsey and their transition into adulthood. A little background on Guernsey, this tiny little speck there in between England and France is the island of Guernsey. It is approximately uh, 25 square miles and contains uh, 65,000 people, of which about 2,500 are the young people in the age group that I specifically looked at. Their education system follows the uh, British system, with primary school, secondary school, um, and then going into A levels, which is similar to high school, the last two years of 17 and 18. It is all provided in Guernsey. However, in order to go to university, it, um, they have to, in order to, uh, for a university degree, this, uh, young people have to leave the island, mostly going to the UK. So that's after the age of 18. So at this um, stage, the young people are, are faced with this great decision of do you attend university or not. And so I'm going to be looking at the um, rite of passage and also what's called the vital conjuncture which is um, defined as in the progression of life, there are crucial time periods in which members of the community decide between a subset of options based on a cultural context, decisions which profoundly affect the member's future. So I'm looking at this specific one of um, going to university and not how that, so I'll take my thesis here. So the experience of leaving the island for university or not creates a temporary disconnect in the conception of adulthood for Guernsey youth. So, Looking first at uh, these youth growing up in Guernsey, what their experience was, there were a few things that united them that uh, my respondents all mentioned. One was the safety of the island. They felt very safe. They mentioned low crime. 
as being one of the main factors of the safety. They also said it was a very sheltered community. And by sheltered, one uh, respondent said that growing up in Guernsey was like being wrapped in cotton wool due to the lack of ethnic diversity and an sort of overly trusting nature that they had, that they weren't streetwise because they hadn't dealt with crime and um, different cultures and of that sort. So I'm looking, going to look at two case studies, uh, one non-university and one person that went to university. First, uh, James, this is where he worked at an Apple store. He talked about that the moment when he decided to, to not go to university and thus became fully employed was his main determinant um, in becoming an adult. So he said here, I was planning on going to university to study journalism, but for one reason or another, I didn't. Then I made the decision that I wasn't going to university. That was the point when I realized that I was becoming an adult. Because at 18, deciding that you weren't going to continue in education, that you were going to sit and stay on the island to earn money and contribute to society in a different way than the way I was before, to realize I actually pay my own bills, I'm being taxed, and I just feel I'm in that moment that I'm still young, but I'm definitely considered more of an adult than a child. So for James, um, as well as the other um, young people that did not attend university, they, 96% uh, uh, of them that I interviewed all remained living at home, even in, um, throughout their 20s. But they reported no problems with their um, parents or family, but mentioned, what, yes, I live at home, but I'm focusing on saving for a, mer uh, for a mortgage um, with the uh, rigid housing prices in um, in Guernsey. Also, a main factor in the process that people that hadn't gone to university said that you need some sort of experience abroad. That until you'd experience either the UK or America, something else, that you could not be considered fully an adult. So Shelley uh, is my example of a university student. Um, her so right of a uh, passage, you could say, or right of conjecture was going to university um, where she experienced the separation from family, friends, and community. Had to completely leave the island, the only way to return through um, flying home, um, a considerable distance and obviously not, not too convenient. And through that, um, she and as well as the other university students had to get over an initial shock and homesickness, which was followed um, eventually by forming of a, a special bond between the university students and eventually re, um, reintegrating themselves into their new roles of living away from parents and being their own bosses. Um, she placed a, a huge emphasis on moving out as being the main factor in becoming an adult, as she said here. Um, I'd say there's definitely something about moving, moving out and growing up because my friends that didn't go to university tend to be people that haven't moved out generally because they haven't moved out. Uh, and yet in my eyes, it's the people that have moved out. Even if they had some kind of dependency on their parents, they can't quite meet rent or can't quite meet their bills, then there's definitely something about moving out of the family house that equates to independence and adulthood. So this independence away from the family and away from home became the main factor for university students. It, um, so much so that in fact, when they finished university and moved home, uh, it became uh, sort of a dif difficult point between them and their parents that there was there was tension and it wasn't until for Shelley that mo once again moving out in Guernsey and getting her own flat was her main focus rather than saving up for a mortgage as was the case for the um, non-university students. So um, a few final universal themes uh, that occurred both for the university and uh, non-university uh, young people was that in contrast to this growing up on the island, once they've gone through their respective processes, there was a renewed appreciation for the island. So once they'd either gone to university, had some experience abroad, um, and m either moved out or were saving for a mortgage, that they, yeah, that they uh, felt they appreciated the island more. It wasn't just this boring place. And it became the place that they wanted to eventually uh, raise kids and get married. Of the people I interviewed, um, only one 
one uh, couple was married in their in their twenties, and most of them talked about getting married not until their late twenties or early thirties. Um, and okay, there was uh, yeah, just one last quote about that, um, talking about the appreciation and wanting to come back. Uh, one um, university student said. I've always said that if I'm going to raise kids, I'm going to raise them here because it's such a beautiful place and it's safe. So thank you. That is my presentation. So we'll just, uh, just uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, we're just going to go down through the presentations. We're going to reserve all our questions after the end, after uh, John Hawkins discussing the team. So, uh, Chelsea, and then we'll have Aubrey after that. I'm Chelsea Panetta. I went to Guernsey as well. And um, my project is Goodness in Guernsey, the role of volunteering in, in bringing solidarity and a sense of community to Guernsey. And uh, my thesis is sense of community exists on the island and it is helping to hold it together with the voluntary organizations playing a key role in helping to develop and preserve the sense of unity and community on the island. And um, the reason I wanted to do this was to see how, to show how other communities can gain more unity. Um, just to add to the background that Pete gave, I think there is two facts are pretty important for my project. Um, the first is the main industry currently on the island is finance and banking, and banking, and because of the to the low tax policies. Um, the finance and banking has been able to really succeed. And then the government on Guernsey is fairly small, and because of that, they're unable to provide a lot of services and, and facilities to the community. And so the people are almost forced to provide them themselves, um, because if the government were to do so, then the taxes would raise and it would cause more problems on the island. And so one way that the people take care of this, they find holes and gaps where services and facilities are needed and they create a charity. And so now there are over 300 charities on the island that are registered. And uh, because of the small population, the island is pretty caring and neighborly, I guess. They um, are very supportive of the charities. They're very willing to offer their time and their money to support the charities and other voluntary organizations um, and this creates a special kind of connectedness or cohesion and of course Durkheim's idea of cohesion is the mechanical and organic solidarities which I won't get into but um, in addition to those um, sense of community sense of community can also be a, co a cohesion and D.W. McMillan and D.M. Chavez defined it as having membership, influence, integration, and fulfillment of needs, and a shared emotional connection. So I'm going to show now how these four elements are found within the voluntary sector, and I'm going to just do it through presenting one charity. Um, it's the Caritas Charity, and it was formed er, and founded by that man on the left and we'll call him Russ today. He is a pastor on the island and he formed the charity in 2008. And he formed it to help troubled youth and young, young adults on the island. And there are three aspects to this charity. The first is the overall goal that they're still working towards. It's the Caritas com community. And their idea is to buy and purchase land to build a housing facility on for troubled youth to come and live on and they'll work on the farm and sell the produce until they can sustain themselves 
and be an active part of society. And currently they have the farm, which is really like a giant garden, and then um, the cafe. So the farm, <coughs> they take in mainly troubled youth and young adults, um, but anyone can volunteer to work there and they just work on the farm, they learn how to do gardening and farming, and then they sell their produce at one of the farmer's markets every week. And then the cafe <coughs> was just established in September actually, so when I was there they were just, it was still in process. But it's a low cost cafe and one of the main goals of the cafe was to encourage people with certain skills in counseling to come and volunteer their time and offer it to anyone who may need like a listening ear. Um, so they would they want them to come at, not as professionals but as friends for those troubled youth who may be at the cafe. Um, so now I will just show how each of those four elements of sense of community fits into Caritas and all the other charities on the island. Um, so Macmillan and Chavez defined membership as feeling as a feeling of belonging and personal relatedness. Um, so Russ, when talking about the cafe, he said we want it to be a place where anybody and everybody feels welcomed. We don't want it to be as a drop-in center and we don't want it for ex-offenders, we want it for everybody. Um, so by opening it up for anyone and encouraging everyone to go there and through their participation in the cafe or the farm, um, these troubled youth can gain a sense of belonging and find their place in the charity and also within the community as they participate. Um, and the next aspect is influence, and Joseph Gusfield defined it as giving special consideration to fellow members and putting their aims above your own. Uh, and Russ talked about his, the charity as a whole and said, no one owns the community except the people who live there and the people who come, into, who come in to help and support. So it's up to each person in the community to, for, to help the community flourish. So it's not only about me and it's not only about you, but it's about our whole vision. And his vision was a big part of um, the charity and it's not just his vision, like a big thing he mentioned was that everyone needs to have a say. And so by being part of this charity, everyone is expected to um, give their own input and participate and help each other out. Um, that leads to integration and fulfillment of needs which is, according to Macmillan and Chavez, a motivator and a motivator of behavior or, sorry, a motivator of behavior and it maintains togetherness. Um, so the skills that are learned on the farm and in the cafe or the skills that are shared, um, with, it helps the troubled youth to, it motivates them to live better lives and it helps them to learn their worth and their value in society so they can better be part of it. And Russ said about them that they come to understand the beauty within them of which they can share with others. So that's like the main goal is to transform these troubled youth into good citizens of the community, which will eventually they'll be able to be integrated into the society as a whole, which will help Guernsey. Um, and then lastly is the shared emotional connection. And McMillan and Chavez say that members have shared, it's when members have shared and will share history, common places, time together, and similar experiences. And Russ gave, um, he told me about this group of boys from one of the schools that come weekly and they work on the farm. And uh, they, every time after they're done working, they take some of the produce that they've harvested and they make a meal together out of it. And they use, he said they used really fine china and really fancy silverware, like things these boys wouldn't have at their homes. And they make a meal together. And he says, we always have afternoon tea together. It is the eating together that is the most imp important. Um, so the relationships that are formed through not just the commensality and the eating, but also just through the participation in the farming and the cafe, it really b builds um, the shared emotional connection that's needed for a sense of community. Um, so why does it matter? Well, for Guernsey, it's really important to have this sense of community, uh, the charity, which the charities create, because it really holds the community together. 
and like this informant Charlie, many others express similar opinions that if you take away the charities from the island, the whole, the, there would be a massive hole in the community. And then just for other communities on a larger scale, if any of them are seeking to be more, um, more united or to gain stronger cohesion, they can look to Guernsey as an example of where to encourage participation. Okay, so I'm Aubrey Banton. Um, I went to the Channel Islands also. And my project is Committees versus Curators, the Use of Power and Knowledge in the Alderney Museum of the Channel Islands. Um, and in this, I examine Foucault's ideas on power and knowledge to understand the apparent tensions between the curator and the administration uh, that runs the Alderney Museum. A uh, little bit of background to build off of Chelsea and Pete. Uh, I went to Alderney, which is a different um, island of the Channel Islands. It's a lot smaller than Guernsey. It's only three and a half by one and a half miles. And on this island, there is one museum known as the Alderney Museum. It is run uh, by a group of elected volunteers um, known as the Alderney Society Council, which I will refer to as the ASC from now on because it's a lot shorter and easier to say. Um, and they also employed uh, from 2006 to 2013, this past summer, they employed a series of graduate students uh, to come in from the mainland and serve as curators in the museum. Um, I noticed that um, the two groups, the curator and the ASC, both use their knowledge sets that they have to legitimize and assert power and control over the other group, uh, whether that's the ASC asserting power and control over the curator or vice versa. Um, and the power and control that they assert is affected by the knowledge set that they have. They believe that that enables them and gives them the power over the other person. Um, as Foucault said um, in his theories, that power and knowledge are inseparably linked. Uh, there is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge, nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. Um, so he talks about how power produces knowledge and vice versa. And I saw this repeatedly in um, the observations that I made in the museum. They also, um, the ASC and the curators, um, as was mentioned by Foucault, um, they use observation to increase their sense of power that they have over the other group. Um, as Foucault talked about in prisons, um, they use observation to assert their power and control and um, influence the actions by making sure the other group um, is very apparent in what they are doing and that their actions are very obvious to the other group. To look at the Alderney Society Council, um, I'm going to first look at the knowledge set of the council and then also look at the knowledge set of the curator, so I'll compare those two. Um, I found that with the ASC, um, they had a series of life and career experiences. Um, this is an island of, um, there are a lot of retired people on the island. Uh, which means that they have had plenty of career experience and life experience, their um, older generation. So they usually apply this experience to um, the museum and their roles there. Uh, for example, in the Alderney Society Council with the museum, uh, they have a lot of experience with uh, managing finances. And so they will give certain volunteer um, volunteer members of the council, they will give them um, or responsibilities related to the finances because they've had those experiences. So for example, um, one of the members of the council, Betty, um, she does anything from minutes to meetings and organizing meetings, mostly to do with donations and membership and funding for the society. There was also a mention, um, there's a shop in the museum, a little shop, and uh, a different committee member um, runs the shop there. And so that just shows again that they apply the life experiences and career experiences that they have to their um, control in the museum. 
they also, um, the ASC seeks to assert their power over the curator. One of the ways that I saw them doing this is because the curator is under the direction and guidance of the ASC. As I mentioned before, they employ um, a series of graduate students to come in. Um, and as one of the members of the council said, you take your orders from the Alderney Society Council. So the council feels very empowered and they think that the curator is answering to them um, because they are paying them to be there. Uh, they also um, sign a contract when they come in that outlines their duties and any time that they stray away from those duties, um, it creates that tension that I talked about earlier. Um, so back to the curator. Um, the curator, their knowledge set is specifically about museum management. Uh, one of the curators that worked there in the past, um, she completed her undergraduate degree at Swansea, which is in England, in ancient history and Egyptology. And then she received a master's degree at Leicester in museum studies. Um, she also participated in a year of volunteer work in various museums, and then she applied for the position in Alderney. So she was obviously very well trained. She had plenty of experience specifically in museum management um, and how to run a museum as a curator. Um, so now to look at how the curator asserts their power over the ASC. Uh, they usually try to move forward independently, but this often meets with conflict from the ASC. Uh, one of the outside volunteers mentioned that, or sorry, this is one of the curators. Um, she said, they block me on things which they shouldn't, so she was talking about the council. Um, I have to explain everything I do and they don't understand why I've done things. So she felt like um, the ASC was um, degrading her knowledge, um, but she obviously felt like she had the right and the power to um, act independently as she wanted to. Um, there was also another outside volunteer who said that um, while the council was being taken over by the curator, it's taken a lot of energy from the museum to deal with that. So in regards to that quote, um, it shows that any time that the curator seems to be acting too independently and moving forward with their own work, um, it meets with conflict um, between the ASC and the curator, and this is what creates the tension, as I mentioned before. Um, so a specific case study that I did um, while I was there, um, the ASC and the curator decided to have an exhibition of art from various Alderney artists, um, and they there's a summer exhibition room that rotates every summer. So in this room, they wanted to show, the curator wanted to show off art pieces from the museum stores um, that had been stored away. They hadn't been seen by the public for a while. So she wanted to show those off. Uh, meanwhile, the ASC wanted to show um, art pieces from modern local artists um, that were on the island. So um, both of them had their own reasons for showing the art that they wanted to show, and both were completely legitimate reasons. Um, the curator was um, looking more for the public and the public's interest and how the museum is there to serve the public. So that's why they, she wanted to present that, those art pieces. Meanwhile, the ASC um, obviously is interested in um, upkeeping the tourism aspect of the museum and attracting local people as well because, you know, our museums aren't always the best funded and so they always are interested in um, promoting that. So. Um, in the end, uh, the ASC um, and the curator came to the conclusion that the ASC was going to display the art that they wanted to from local artists. Um, and this just kind of shows how time and time again I was seeing that the ASC was asserting their power over the curator and um, often winning out, uh, so to speak, over the curator. Um, and so they displayed a series of photographs and watercolors and such from uh, local artists. Um, so that just reiterates the fact that um, the Alderney Society Council and the curators are constantly um, creating this tension between each other because they believe their own knowledge sets give them um, control over the other group and this is what empowers them over the curator or the counselor, whoever the other group is. There we go. Okay. Is this and turn the light on. 
Sure. She says my time's up. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to hear from you. <laughs> okay, you will time me, please, and warn me, all right? Okay. <laughs> no, all right. We have three papers here that are drawn from the same uh, field school field experience and the same field school year, correct? Um, in the, uh, at the Channel Islands. Now, my duty here is to critique the papers, and I'm carrying out this duty in relation to uh, the presumed goal of trying to prepare them for uh, the stated goal of our department courses, which is to prepare a publishable paper. And one of the things that you will find in life is that, hmm, how do I want to put this? A good critique is one of the most precious things, but perhaps one of the toughest things, but one of also one of the rarest things that you will get. And the second thing I would say is, uh, people who give critiques, um, you only invest in, in a really tough critique if you think that the product can be developed out of it. So I'm going to be tough, I'm going to try and be professional with you, and I want you to use these to develop the publication potential that's in each of these papers. Okay, now, Peter, uh, growing up gradations on Guernsey. You had, um, you were looking at, for example, with a definition of a theorist on conjunctures. And the conjuncture definition was this notion that there are these points at which you have a selection of options and that in choosing the option, that's going to have a long-term impact on your life. So that was one major theoretical model that was available in your paper. A second theoretical model was the uh, rite of passage notion of transitioning to adulthood. And now you've got two models, and you don't tie them together well. Uh, you could talk about um, some of the issues of adult attributes as also being conjuncture points, but you don't bring any of that out. So I get left with a kind of a feeling that there are two, um, maybe even three, uh, major themes that are not integrated well. The third theme is that you begin with several uh, quotes about how wonderful and safe Guernsey is. And you ended with a quote about what a beautiful and safe place it is. And that's a third theme, which is not the same as transition to adulthood, and nor is it the same as choosing from selections and how that selection impacts your life. So how would the selection model of either going to the university or not going to the university impact moving forward in your life? And we don't have that set of data. How, what are all the attributes of transition to adulthood could be another focused paper, but we don't really have all of the attributes of transition to adulthood. And a third paper could be um, perceptions of beauty and safety as a goal in life that attracts people to stay or go and come back. But we don't quite get that one either. Okay? So I would challenge you to, um, uh, to pick one of those as being your anchor and you can have the others being shadowed in a paragraph or two, but you've got to have one be central in order to get a journal paper out of this. Now the second thing that I would say about your paper, and this may be an unfair critique because this is a, a stripped down version of your paper, but by and large, uh, it may be indicative of a larger problem, and that is um, in, I didn't count the pages, three, six, nine, ten pages, five or six of them are laying out the theory with absolutely no ethnographic data. 
Um, and the strength of anthropology is the data that, uh, that you acquire uniquely. And I know you've got more. And so I would encourage you to pour more of the Guernsey men's and young men's and women's, or even adults that are talking about young men and women, pour more of their language and more of their episodes of experience into your paper and trim down the, um, uh, the theory section, especially in the beginning. Maybe use theory as a wrap-up at the end, but um, push that data, which is where you are expert. Nobody else has probably really sat down and studied Guernsey's uh, young people of that age group ever, probably. So bring out the strength of your data on that and uh, slough off these irrelevant theorists. They're all going to disappear anyway. The, the, do the theories change every eight to ten years or faster? <laughs> okay. Point is, the data is where the real strength of anthropology is. And the ability to perceive the humanity of these, what are they called, Guernseyites? I don't know what to, what? Guerns. Guerns? Guerns. Uh, um, the ability f of, for us to empathize with them is dependent on how much you pour their souls into, the, into your paper. And, and it's not with the theorists. But you do have to have the theorists for a hook. Not, well, not the hook for, in your sense. Okay, uh, you're right, I've got to keep moving. <clears throat> okay, paper number two, uh, Chelsea. <clears throat> In a similar way, I would also say there, there's only a limited amount of the people and their expressions, although you did have several good uh, clips of their talk and, and your pictures of them in the gardens was ethnographically helpful. Um, nevertheless, uh, the richness of their life and their experience didn't quite come through well. And secondarily, I would say uh, in your thesis of um, that, that the, um, uh, that these voluntary charitable organizations build community you need to take these quotes and underline or tell us what parts of the quotes really are uh, of importance to you in showing the connection back to your theoretician. And that, the same comment would be on, on yours, on all three of them, really. So underline and tease apart. Don't just say, uh, the theorist said such and such, and here's a quote that illustrates it bring out, you need to direct my and any reader's attention, and all three of you need to direct the reader's attention to those parts that are being, that are being teased out which confirm your argument, okay? Um, and again, with all three, um, there's a tendency for you to get a theorist and then you are taking snippets of illustration to illustrate the theorists. Whereas I would much more like to see Gern culture, Gern's culture, come out independently and then talk about its relevance to a theorist, but make those theorists secondary to the proposition of making the ethnography feel real to the reader and rich and deep and grabbing and uh, fulfilling and um, so that I can empathize with it because I couldn't in, in any of the papers really get into the situation that they are living and thinking. Um, things like the holes and gaps filled by charity or, or your final quote that there would be a great hole you didn't really get at how many, well you did in, in saying 300 charities, but 
what kinds of gaps and what kinds of holes and then and then the other part is how it brings community together we didn't really really get at that central issue in your thesis um, Aubrey your paper was more focused in, in the sense that you had just one <coughs> tight uh, conflict between the museum curator and the, uh, the set of uh, directors of the um, uh, ASC or uh, whatever that was. And your paper resolves, revolves around that conflict, but you told us there is a conflict. You gave us a couple of quotes indicating there's, but then all you did was say, this is an illustration of the conflict. Um, I would like you to get into either Victor Turner's material on social drama in uh, Schism and Continuity in an African Society or Van Velsen's material on um, uh, what's it called, the case study method in social anthropology and show how these conflicts evolve and we need, um, we need their wording. For example, um, uh, you were talking about the tension between them. What did the, um, the curator say when she said, I can't see where it is here and I've run out of time to look for it, but the curator said, they won't let me do what, what I'm supposed to do. What did she say she's supposed to do and why? Did you, did, did you push on those words? Um, what are the rules or the standards? What does she think as a curator she has to follow? My hunch is that she is going back to some kind of loyalty to her profession, that she's hired as a curator from a museum studies program, and that there are ethical standards there. But tease, somewhere in your notes, hopefully, you've got her telling you why she has to do it this way, and why she can't quite give or doesn't want to give in to those other guys. And we want those whys, because then we will understand the logic that she's pressing forward, uh, that, that is pressing on her to, to resist. Conversely, on our people from that committee, you give a, a little bit of their, um, their business background, but what are their motivations? What are they trying to tell us? Uh, or what are they trying to do? And probably in that art exhibit thing, their loyalty, I suspect, is to the island and their community, and they're boostering the community, and they probably have, they're probably not seeing a museum in, in a traditional definition. What's their definition of museum? Or what's their definition of what any institution ought to be doing? And, and why do they volunteer and get the, whatever their boosterism of the community? Because it, it looks like they wanted to make five or 10 local artists uh, give them a boost in their careers and boost the sales and attract the tourists and so on. Um, so you've got community boosterism versus museum loyalty, probably somewhere in there. And it might not just be who's got the power or not, but um, how are they manipulating those knowledge bases and their commitments to the goodness of museum ethics and their commitment to the goodness of community and you could really pull a neat um, analysis of that out. Uh, now, all three of you have got the ear markings that those papers can do it. I've got two minutes? Or I'm oh, done. Yeah. Yeah. I'm you're done. Ignoring my two minutes. So <laughs> you're supposed to holler at me. <laughs> In the AAA, they'll hang on the table and make you look at it. OK. Focus. Yours worked well because you had the focus, but you didn't put in enough of the cultural information. Your two didn't have, yours had middle focus. Yours had three very distinct ways to go. But in any case, in all three of them, pouring the local cultural information, getting the quotes in, in quotes, and then not just giving quotes, but telling me, the reader, how do I read that thing from a Guernsean mindset to really see what's there? And you'll all three end up with something really good, but you got work to do still.
so we have a couple of minutes for uh, questions. If either of the three panelists want to uh, respond to John, or we could just, uh, I suppose somebody has to, maybe I'll moderate questions, Cindy had her hand up, somebody wants to. I really, I think you really need to understand the context of I mean, it may be that the museum is not really in the minds of the ASC. It might not be a museum. It might be a tourism booster board or, a, you know, the, the local tourist uh, advancement agency for the community. I don't know. I like one thing that maybe there's a, is there a mission statement for this museum? Yes. Okay, so that's what the museum sees itself involved. But do the ASC abide by it? It's a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So well, that, and, that needs to and following up on that, one question I have, if, if you're using Foucault as an analytic, uh, what I saw you as saying was something more like, you know, this person, there was even a quote up there that said something like, uh, knowledge. Um, you take orders from this person, right? Mm -hmm. That seems to be a much more explicit sort of in your face workings of power, much more than the insidious power knowledge dynamic that yeah. Foucault is talking about. Where, or there are people who have written about that more recently, particularly the Kamras, for example, thinking about the distinction between hegemony and ideology, uh, where the, your reality is so constituted by the power knowledge base that you almost don't even realize that that's sort of, you know, discursively, you know, uh, structuring your subjectivity or whatever. So if you're going to use Foucault as an analytic, I would want to see something more along the lines of that type of data as opposed to this sort of you take orders from this person or you have the authority to decide what the collection is and I don't uh, type of thing. But yeah, that gets to John's point about the type of data. Yeah. You can get more of that of, you know, so you say somebody wins out, how do they win out? But there's, there's an argument and then somehow out of an argument comes something. And then why is it, what's the logic? You know, yeah. John mentioned what's the logic that sort of dictates the meaning. Each side will justify something yeah. in their statement as being obviously right, and, and yet they'll be in conflict, and for you to tease those out and present them to us, it admits us to the real core of dispute, and it shows us where the cultural fractures and boundary lines are and so on. Uh, I think just speak out if you can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to moderate it. Greg, I'll moderate it. Uh,
one thing that this is kind of following on what John was saying is I have the same question that I wrote down here. What about practice? So you have a lot of quotes in your talk, right? Uh, and I think maybe for all three of you, but and I, and I see that in some of the students in my section of the thesis writing as well. Do you imagine that quotes are the only type of sort of tangible data? But part of the power of ethnography is really sort of being so involved in the local scene that you get a good local a sense of what practice actually involves in this. Because it strikes me, and I'm using practice in a more three sense, right? What types of practices are is uh, Caritas actually engaging in to foster these senses of community that it did throughout there? I think that itself sort of good ethnographic writing oftentimes gives such a deep sense of those practices that you can see how the things they're doing, not just what they're saying, but what they're actually doing fosters that sense of community uh, within that. And I, I would think that would really bolster, I mean, again, quotes are not the only data, right? It's your ethnographic descriptions of practice that you want to make that case. But now, Chelsea's talking about the practice of having the group meet together with stemware and plain silver. And, uh, and, and, so, and that kind of practice can be developed further. But uh, out of that practice, though, are you going to look at what the, the hole that the HOLE, the, the, the gap that the um, uh, agency fills that the government is not filling, which was one theme in your paper. Uh, okay, they're serving uh, unprivileged kids that might become criminals if they don't get active in some way but you don't then tap into the other part of your paper, which was building a sense of community, which seems to be larger than just the group meeting together and being buddies with each other, male and female, I don't know what the mix is, doesn't matter. So you didn't exploit that, uh, the Caritas group, for how Caritas creates any larger system of community, it's only what it does for the people inside. So pick either, Gaps that are being filled. This is an island that has a low tax structure, and people have got to pitch in and do what needs to be done to have society, or develop more how it creates a larger community. That's that's harder call. Okay, we owe you all a break, so uh, let's take uh, seven minutes. There's food here. Stand up, stretch, and we're gonna. The panels for the next section. We want to get your if you have powerpoints, we have them on the computer right now. So we'll reconvene at seven minutes at two o'clock. All right, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, again, you probably all know. So if anybody didn't get a program, in fact, maybe I'll just pass those around if you want to see the schedule. If you don't want one, fine. We'll just put them back. But you can see the uh, schedule here. We've finished the first paddle, which uh, panel, which was all uh, Guernsey stuff, and now we're moving to Southeast Asia. Um, so as with before, we'll hold our questions till the end. Uh, Charles Knuckles is going to be our discussant after Krista, Lindsay, April, Ricky, and Rachel. And Rachel's going to be presenting via Skype, so we'll, uh, we'll work that out uh, right before her talk. So we're going to go ahead and start with uh, Krista, and then we'll have ten, dis ten minutes for discussion afterwards, and then another break to continue the discussion. So Krista. Thank you. Okay, so my paper is titled Mong Fall from Grace, Messianic Structures in History. Um, so a long time ago, there was a big flood throughout the whole world. When the world was flooded, there were only two groups of people left. There was Noah in his ark, and there were two Hmong people floating in a drum, a very large drum that they used for funerals. Um, God saved the boat with Noah and the drum with these two Hmong people. And when the flood waters receded, um, God taught Ngao Ia and Drao Ong, I'm really bad with Hmong, I'm sorry guys, the two Hmong people, how to be man and wife. Um, the woman gave birth to an egg, which had the ability to um, give birth to all races of people. After she gave birth, uh, God made the egg bigger and bigger, and all all the races of people were in it, and that's how they repopulated the earth. Um, after this, God taught them how to live. He told them to go find a land for them to live together as Hmong people. 
Uh, however, they didn't want to do as God told them, and this was the beginning of their fall. Um, I was told this story, and this is just the beginning of it, over lunch one afternoon with the leader of the Indi Ninu uh, messianic group with the leader and his right-hand man and my translator. Uh, my intention going into this interview was to kind of learn some background about this messianic group to help with my original project, which was going to be about the places that they're using. But when I came back, I realized that this story had a lot more to it, and I was m much more interested in that, so I switched to that. Um, so for my paper, I'm arguing that the members of the Hmong Messianic group, Imbi Minu, um, have refra refashioned the generally held Hmong history. The Ibi leaders, uh, following the lead of their deceased prophet, are attempting to reconfigure the structures of significance for Hmong to imagine their own origins and history. Using Solon's framework, the traditionally imagined history can be seen as a structure of conjuncture which, when confronted with recent Hmong history, including the secret war, mass death and destruction, and the fight from Laos, became reconfigured by these messianic practitioners into a slightly new version of this history. In the newer, vi in the newer version, the relative depravity of Hmong compared to other successful or developed groups, such as the Thais, Americans, British, or French, further present these messianic practitioners with a need to rethink historical reasons why Hmong fit in the contemporary world order and have experienced such tragedy the way they do. This rethinking becomes the newly formed structure of significance for them, a new version of Hmong history. This is directly parallel to uh, Solon's examination of how Captain Cook presented a new phenomenon which fit nicely into the Hawaiian's mythical reality, but the interactions that ensued that ultimate, ultimately ended in Cook's death provided the catalyst of transformation as the structures were re reproduced, working Cook into the new version of the structures of significance. In Solon's, in Solon's terms, reproduction becomes transformation and vice versa. And so this group is reproducing Hmong history to transform Hmong present. Um, and so, just a couple, I'll just go over one example of the story because I don't have a lot of time. And then, yeah. So, the first instance to the fall of the Hmong is, as I said before, after the waters receded, God instructed them to go find a land to live in. That would just be for Hmong people. Um, and so he asked these two brothers to do that, but they didn't really want to do it. And so they asked a frog, it was a very big frog with eyes on top of each other, um, that God had saved during the flood. Um, they asked the frog to do it for them, but the frog didn't have the ability to do it. And so they got angry with it and they tortured it and they hurt it. Um, and so they were not able to find a land because they did not do as God instructed them to. So part of the goals of this messianic group is to um, establish a place, a central place for Hmong people to be able to come together and to be part of this religion um, and just to come together. And so And so they're trying to correct this mistake that they had made in, this, in the past. Um, and um, so this, this, exa this first example and the other four examples are layered with meaningfulness and importance, as Sons explains it, that provides cultural value for EB history. Um, with this story, Ibi can explain why Hmong people don't have a country but are instead a minority in other people's countries and why fallen Hmong practice shamanism 
or I'm sorry, Falun Gong practice shamanism and how important it is for them to follow God's commandments now, um, now that he's providing them with this chance once again. Um, and so, and so I'm using Solon's theoretical framework to do that. And I don't know how to edit this part of stuff. That's the end. Bye. <laughs> Academic papers don't have in the name of Jesus Christ. In coming to Thailand, I became interested in the idea of conversion because of the particularly unique religious situation that Hmong in the northern Thai village where I conducted my field work are embedded in. Traditionally, Hmong people practice a mixture of spirit rituals and ancestor worship, classified as shamanism and often referred to as old culture. Though these practices have long been established and are most commonly practiced in the village, alternative religious groups have more recently established their presence, including Christian sects and Hmong Messianic groups, like one that Krista just talked about. <laughs> As I delved into the anthropological discourse on conversion, conversion, I discovered Joel Robbins' model for understanding conversion as, as a discontinuous process. His model challenges the prior understanding of conversion, which was one of cultural continuity, in which researchers identified religious hybrids of Christianity and native traditional practices. In contrast, Robbins argues that this analysis misunderstands the process of Christianization, contending that the nature of conversion to Christianity requires a break from the past. Rupture, he argues, defines conversion. However, I found that though Robbins' representation of, of religious transition matches up well with the conversion narratives that, that these Hmong converts shared with me. It varies substantially from the actual process of conversion that I observed in both Christian, Christianity and Messianism. This paper offers a critique and a corrective of his model in this particular local context. Though Hmong converts with whom I interacted expressed their conversion to be much like that of Robin's model, that is, a complete break from the past, Similarities between shamanism, Christianity, and messianism reveal a much more syncretic approach to religious faith. These significant similarities exist, I argue, because of the underlying ontological assumptions that permeate the bounds of these three religious entities. While studying religiosity in this village, I found that Hmong converts with whom I interacted Imagine, themsel imagine themselves to be part of a discontinuous process of conversion, as Robin's model would predict. Nearly all converts I interviewed from one Christian congregation and a particular, particular messianic group clearly expressed that they no longer participated in any shaman rituals, though they acknowledged that they may occasionally attend family rituals to maintain kinship obligations, converts explicitly disassociated themselves with their cultural past. Many clearly identified themselves as living a distinctly different life from their friends and neighbors that still practiced old culture shamanism. In telling me their conversion stories, Hmong converts would speak in a language connoting rupture. One Christian convert that had a particularly dramatic conversion experience told of his communication with God that changed his life. In his words, he explained, <coughs> I wanted to know if God was really there. I asked him, are you really there, God? If you are really there, come change my heart. He went on to tell me that one morning when praying to God, he heard his voice saying that he had been forgiven and cleansed and that he was a new person now and that he was his child. The idea of fundamental change is central to, the con to his conception of conversion. This man experienced a break from the past so poignant that he now considered himself to be a new person. And central to this transformative exper experience was the introduction to God, a constant in both Christian and me Messianic converts' experiences I learned of. Yet, it became apparent to me that even with their conceptual break from the past, 
undeniable similarities between the new faiths on the one hand and shamanism on the other reveal belief systems less distinctly different than perceived by their members. In making sense of these continuities, my research examines the role of ontology. Although religion, as understood from a Western perspective, is a, a mere cultural construct, behind this construct lies an ontology that informs how groups and individuals live out their lives and their interactions with one another and with the, the metaphysical world. Those deeply embedded in these religious contexts understandably find it difficult to notice the similarities indicative of a deeper shared ontology. Yet, the way these Hmong villagers understand the world affects nearly every aspect of their lives. In a village where the majority of Hmong practice traditional shamanism, the shared worldviews for all inhabitants remain greatly influenced by it. This ontology won't disappear when an individual converts to Christianity or Messianism. Rather, the new belief is grafted onto the old faith to create an untidy, syncretic overlapping of beliefs. In short, because this messianic sect emerged out of a Hmong context specifically for Hmong people, and because the local congregation, uh, the local Christian congregation, is comprised ex exclusively of Hmong believers, they were both created or reconceptualized in a Hmong shaman context and therefore share many of the same core ontological beliefs. To better illustrate these ideas, I will provide several examples. The first is one of one messianic woman who, though not a convert herself, expresses the same underlying assumptions as converts associated with the group. When, when I asked this woman what experience, experiences deepened her faith and her conviction, she shared stories of prayer and how this practice is intertwined with ideologies of the spirit. According to traditional shamanist beliefs of the spirit, an, an individual's physical problems are often connected with his or her spirit. Sometimes the spirit leaves the body and it, it must be called back. In this particular instance, she compared praying to God to the typical old culture practice of calling the spirit when someone has been injured. For example, if her child fell down, she told me that, quote, I'll just pray to God to return the spirit and he'll be fine. In this instance, <clears throat> this messianic woman draws together prayer to God, a messianic practice, with the shaman belief that the spirit can wander and get lost, and it must be called back. When her child got injured, she tapped into the underlying shaman influence assumption that there was a problem with the spirit, but rather than turning to a shaman for guidance, she would pray to God. Although she is a member of this messianic group, this woman understands the concept of the spirit through the lens of shamanism. Though the method for retrieving the spirit is different in messianic practice, the underlying ideology has not changed. A second example is that of healing, which serves a central purpose behind many rituals practiced in shamanism. The shaman is called in, ritual money is burned on behalf of the spirits and often an animal is sacrificed. Through these spiritual means, shaman dis shamans discover what is causing the physical problem and what can be done to rectify it. Praying to God replaces the shaman rituals that old culture Hmong practice in search of a cure for physical and spiritual ailments. Christian and Messianic converts conveyed to me that faith in God and reliance on him would provide all the health and assistance they would ever need. <coughs> Likewise, regarding prayer, another Messianic practicing woman informed me that she was sick in the flesh. She would take medicine and turn to other medical practices, but if she was sick in the spirit, then she would turn to God in prayer. Upon inquiring as to how she would pray for healing of the spirit, she offered these words as an example of a short prayer. O oh God, Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, O oh God, today my child is sick. Please come see if my child is sick from evil spirits or from weather or got hurt during doing something. Please come remove this sickness so that it won't come and hurt us anymore. I will happily go by candles and burn them for you. Much like the previous example, this woman seems to replace a typical shaman ceremony with prayer to God. According to old culture practices, if an individual is sick, a shaman is called in to perform a ritual and communicate with the spirits to discover the reason behind the sickness and what can be done to alleviate it. In this case, this messianic woman replaces the role of a shaman with prayer to God. She asks him what, what caused the sickness of the spirit and offers to burn candles as an offering in order to heal it. She also recognizes that a possible cause of the physical illness 
could be evil spirits that have inhabited the child. This belief is also shared by Hmong practicing old culture. This link between the physical body, the spirit, and the metaphysical world carries throughout old culture, messianism, and Christianity. The ontological views about the spirit, the metaphysical realms, and how the world is arranged inform the way in which practices in each of these phases are carried out. Thus, although ritual practices in old culture and new beliefs may appear different, I contend they nonetheless fulfill the same ontological functions. Though the Hmong villagers I interacted with stressed the clear differences between old culture practices and new faiths, and rightfully so, a common underlying ontology undeniably persists and profoundly influences how they live their lives and come to understand their existential context. The syncretism observable in these three religious entities allows for a continuous transition that contradicts Robin's model of, conver of conversion and the conceptions of the Hmong converts themselves, who remain embedded in their preconceived ontologies. Thank you. Okay. So, in an ethnically charged event, Thai farmers with Thai Royal Forestry Department officials and other government officials cut down thousands of Hmong owned lychee trees. We go, Ricky, do I go right? Sorry. How do I get it to the next one? Oh, I see. Perfect. Thank you. Lychee trees were a major cash crop for many of the families I interviewed and this lychee tree incident caused significant financial loss. Here are some of the incident, um, photos, images of the incident. Um, so here you can see um, a field that was just chopped down. So imagine um, you know, about 100 more of these types of fields in a mountain valley. Um, the second image that I have here, if you see up in the right-hand corner, you can actually see um, where there's green trees. So all the brown, where the brown is, that's where the Hmong fields were and where the green is, that was a Thai field. So you can see that it was an ethnically charged event. Okay. So Hmong worked for over a decade to receive compensation for the trees and eventually did receive some compensation. I went to Thailand about 13 years after the event and within two years of Hmong receiving compensation. I researched how Hmong narrate the event, specifically focusing on the compensation process as a form of protest. In this presentation, I argue that these narratives represent Hmong attempts to renegotiate th their positioning in relation to Thai. Through, re through refuting Thai assumptions, Hmong simultaneously claim equality and renegotiate subaldernity. As Saadi and Abu Lugad argue, memory is one of the few weapons available to those against whom the tide of history has turned. Memory and the transformation of memory into narratives are methods for subalternate altered groups to confront and contradict dominant assumptions. Narratives allow people to readjust and reimagine their past, present, and future. In one way, as Tapp argues, people selectively represent the past in order to explain how present inter and intra group relationships came to be. Narratives of the past are equally about constructing the present and projecting the future. Through these narratives, my respondents are attempting to renegotiate their positioning with ties they do this through engaging Thai assumptions and responding and refuting these assumptions, arguing instead that Hmong are legal, law-loving, non-communist, educated Thai citizens. While I initially planned to interview only Hmong leaders in this compensation effort, I quickly realized that there were only two or three leaders. I then started interviewing people who, were, um, who had trees that were cut down or people who participated in the event, in the compensation efforts. I ended with 37 people, 
just over 40 interviews, and while I mostly spoke to men since they were more engaged in the process, I also interviewed women. Since I primarily wanted to solicit narratives about the incident I, and the compensation process, I asked questions such as, tell me what led up to the ties cutting down the trees. How did Mong react? And what did Mong do next? In this presentation, again, I argue that the narratives I collected in response to these questions represent Hmong attempts to renegotiate their positioning in relation to Thai. Through refuting Thai assumptions, Hmong simultaneously claim equality and renegotiate subalternity. While the narratives were spoken to me by recognizing and confronting Thai assumptions, Hmong are directing these narratives to Thais. This would happen when they were explaining what led up to the incident or what happens now between Hmong and Thais. Throughout his narrative, one man refuted several assumptions. He said, so about the point that was mentioned about us trying to steal their country, this is not true. In this section, he begins by identifying the assumption that Thailand is a country for ethnic Thais and Hmong, who are non-Thais, are trying to steal it. He ends by refuting the assumption, this is not true. He then proceeded to explain why, that he and all other Hmong in Thailand are Thai citizens, and by conclusion, he said, we have rights too. In the following quote, this same man is discussing a nationwide drought that happened prior to the lychee tree incident, that he says Thais blamed on Hmong. They said that because we went to cut down trees to farm, that it caused a drought to happen. That was just an excuse. It is not the reason because all the nearby areas were in this drought. They cannot throw the problem of drought throughout all Thailand on us. This man follows the same pattern of expressing a Thai assumption, they said, and then directly countering it. That was just an excuse. And this man moves from the past tense in his narrative to discuss present, past accusations into the present tense, emphasizing that these are present day problems. Other Thai accusations that my respondents brought up included Hmong making and selling drugs, Hmong being communists, and Hmong destroying the environment. While on the surface these accusations are set in the past in their narratives, they reflect present issues Hmong are refuting in an attempt to bring equality into their situation. For instance, on October 24, 2013, the Bangkok Post reported, quote, that three tribe Hmong tribesmen were arrested with 2.3 million methamphetamine pills. On June 30, 2011, the Bangkok Post reported, quote, a blurred photo of a Hmong hill tribe man sitting on a dead tiger is clear evidence to police that the animals are still being hunted in Thai wildlife sanctuaries. These are just two common examples and they are significant. Even if these accounts are true, these men are identified as, quote, Hmong hill tribesmen and not Thai citizens. This is not simply an inaccurate legal dis distinction, but it's also a demarcating social category with significant with significant connotations. And these connotations feed back into the assumptions that Hmong face and address in their narratives. Academic literature also cites Hmong in a context of fighting negative, negative assumptions. Tom Ford argues that many Thais view Hmong as uneducated, rebellious wind farmers who are ruining the environment. And while this view is changing to some degree, it is because Hmong are altering their farming methods. Dalcor similarly argues that Thais see Hmong as ecologically destructive. And while this is also a change in perception, there is still an, a, quote, entrenched feeling among lowlanders of superiority over the, quote, backward hill tribes. I present all these examples to give context for the narratives, but also to show that the accusations Hmong present in their narratives reflect a current context that Hmong are in. Hmong are addressing present accusations in crafted narratives of the past, and in the act of addressing present accusations, they are renegotiating socio-political positioning. Hmong are renegotiating or redefining their, their relationship with Thais. Hmong recreate the past to present a more assertive present and a continued positive trajectory in the future. As Shine argues, elite versus subaltern positioning shifts. She argues that socio social positioning is mobile and that subordination is, quote, anxiously reconstituted by those seeking to evade it. In our Thai Hmong case, the notion that Thais are eternal elites and Hmong are stagnant subordinates is inaccurate, according to my Hmong res respondents. While my respondents may not have dramatically changed their legal positioning in Thailand, they are seeking to rene renegotiate it through their socio-political positioning in Thai society, at least in their narratives. As I discussed above, in addressing Thais, Hmong contradict Thai assumptions. But they also present themselves as equal, law-abiding Thai citizens. As one person said, Hmong people like the law. Another person confronted that accusation and countered it with who he felt Hmong really were. Quote, we are not bad like what they think. 
We always live by the law and are living peacefully. They are the ones who reported that we are bad. Sandwiching a Hmong rebuttal between two I Thai accusations, he, uses, he utilizes demarcated le, which means they, and be, which means we, to distinguish inaccuracies from his reality. And finally, another man said, no matter what kind of a people we are, we respect and honor the kings and leaders in this country. We make a living according to what the government allows us to. Therefore, we have the right to justice. He begins by claiming Hmong honor and respect the current Thai state, significant because this claim challenges what Hmong see as a basic Thai assumption, that Hmong are hoping to rebel and take over Thailand. This man then argues that, they be, that because they lawfully make a living, Hmong too, despite being Hmong and not ethnic Thais, have a right to justice and a claim to equality. He and many others narrated an incident that happened 13 years ago. And in narrating, he and many others challenged present Thai accusations of Hmong and demanded instead that Hmong were equal to Thais. These narratives haven't necessarily changed much between Thai and Hmong, but they do show a narrative redefining or renegotiating subalternity in relation to Thais. Thank you. The merchant called the little girl over to finalize the deal, counted 12 bundles, and multiplied the agreed upon per bundle price by 10. Before I could inform her of the math error she made, she turned the phone calculated to the little girl and showed her the final price on the screen and quickly paid her cash. Earlier that morning, I had asked Zia, the merchant, if I could, buy, if I could be a fly on the wall and learn how she did business. By this time, I observed that she had twice seemed to wait for the moment when this preteen's mom was too busy and would call the little girl over to act in the mother's place. In one instance, the trash bag full of bamboo shoots caused the old-fashioned 20 kilogram scale to rotate about 400 degrees and read at five kilograms, when in fact there were um, about 30 kilos in the bag. The scale had a bank blank space between the 20 and the zero mark. Um, that would have accounted for about five kilograms. When the merchant did business with the little girl, the merchant pointed to the 20 and the 5, and then convinced the, the little girl that the 20 and the 5 on the scale meant that there were 25 kilos in the bag, and then sent her on her way. Meanwhile, Zia got a sack full of bamboo shoots with an additional 5 kilograms inside, which she then would resell to people in the market. With the Kennedy Center travel offices, offices warnings to be wary of fraud and advice from friends who had been to Southeast Asian markets, I expected this form of dishonest business in the metropolitan tourist markets. In a sleepy village, however, like the one I was in, the actions of the merchant caught me off guard. This experience in the village market, observing Hmong selling in marketplaces in many other cities, and interviews with rural and urban vendors led me to wonder about the reach of claims that other Hmong development scholars had made while in Thailand. Nicholas Tapp, an expert on Hmong in Southeast Asia, writes about the urban Hmong of the 90s, universalizing their tr traditional relative tribal morality. My findings suggest that Hmong merchants in the village market had a more universalized social ethic, even when compared to urban Hmong merchants. Um, the business in front and home and back displayed in this picture is not only how stores are often set up in the village, but represents to me the disruption of the family structure by business practices. This is a presentation on my findings in Thailand this summer, making a profit at what cost, the social and economic realities facing Hmong entrepreneurs in village markets. Today I will discuss the shift I observed in the views of traditional social ethics. Um, Marshall Sullen's relative tribal morality um, when judging ethics will, be put, will put more moral weight on actions done to those within their ethnic group than to those outside of it. Universalizing this ethic would consist of behavior previously appropriate to those furthest from oneself and spreading it to those relatively close. As this happens, behavior previously appropriate to those closest to one becomes appropriate to those who are further away in the social structure. For instance, my host family, who were, the merch who were merchants in the village market, took me in as their son. 
as her son, my mother performed her motherly roles very well, like sewing me my own pants so I could fit in with the family for family photos. <laughs> um, with the family pictured here, I remember feeling out of place when my mother moved us to take pictures um, in front of the truck so people could see how they did business and had me hold the vegetables because it showed people how they made their money um, because she sold these vegetables. And then placed me in between her and her husband and her daughter in, for the photo, placing me right in the center of their family, making livelihood as the setting and then having me a foreigner in the center hinted to me that these rural merchants were not viewing me with the traditional Hmong ethic. Responses to vignettes and actions in the village market more dramatically highlight an ethical shift. To give a little bit of setting for the data, here's a map of northern Thailand and the two field sites I spent most of my time in. Um, Baklang is the, the pink X to the right, and that's the rural site, and, the, and Chiang Mai is the, the X to the right, and it's the second biggest city in Thailand. Um, while in Baklang, I was able to interview 17 merchants who currently sold in Baklang and who have, com and subsequently have compared, I, I subsequently have compared their interviews to 12 structured interviews done with the Hmong raised in Baklang, but who currently resided and did business in Chiang Mai. To check Tap's claim of what a traditional Hmong ethic would look like, I also met with a focused group of farmers in Baklang who provided me with their view. They were my control group, if you will. One vignette I shared was a story about Baal and his uncle. His uncle was a ritual master and a sto store owner. Baal makes the decision to stop helping his uncle's store with his patronage for getting a cheaper price from another store close by. A while after Baal stopped attending his store, Baal calls, the, Baal calls upon the uncle to do a ritual healing for his family. The uncle, however, is unwilling to help Baal. After sharing this story, I would ask the interviewees, among other questions, who they felt sinned more in this vignette. The focus group of farmers came to the agreement that both were sinning equally because both relatives were holding back from helping kin. As I interviewed the Chiang Mai vendors, there was a change in the view of social ethic, ethics from the village to the city, as was to be expected per Tap's argument, um, that the universalization was due to pressures of an urban environment and awareness of a larger world. For example, one vendor stated, both people sin the same. In buying things, Ball wants to buy for a low price, Baal doesn't want to buy the expensive things, but the uncle sells for an expensive price. And when Baal is not able to buy an item, one will go to another place. On the other hand, if Baal's son is ill, you want to cause the uncle to help, but he is not willing to help. So, oh yo, both people sin the same. Again, the interviewee initially outright states that they both sin the same, but does not substantiate her argument too much uh, for why Baal is really at fault. In fact, later on, she states that the uncle has a price that is too expensive uh, and his relatives cannot buy for him, so he should saw dushia, or just not be sad about it. Um, she continues, his relative is sick, then he must go and help. As with this interview, other interviewers in Chiang Mai would state that the fault landed on both individuals, often citing that if you don't help one relative, they'll not help you back. Um, but ultimately in these interviews, even though they initially stated that both were at fault, they leaned towards the side that, that the uncle was more at fault. By the time I interviewed the... Oh. In Baklang, I was placed in a situation where I felt like ball. At the beginning of my stay in Baklang, I would buy water from a merchant that was a sister of my host father for about 15 baht. She had a smaller store with a limited selection, but was very nice and had water when I needed it. As I went about interviewing, I would buy the same water brand from different stores and noticed that there was a price disparity. The supermarket in the village, about a minute by bike from the first vendor I bought water from, would sell the water for four baht cheaper, and I started to buy there and stopped attending the first market that I attended. By the time I interviewed the manager of the supermarket, the owner's wife, I had learned that the owner of the cheaper supermarket was also the older brother of the first vendor. I felt like Baal, who had left a relative to go buy from a cheaper source, but in this case, it was a little bit more complicated because I left one relative to go buy from another. 
Uh, with this dilemma in mind, it was interesting to hear her response to the vignette. Um, she said, I think the uncle's heart is narrow. A big business like mine sells a lot, so it needs to buy in bulk. In bulk, I can, si I can buy items for a bit cheaper, and therefore I can sell the items for a bit cheaper. If a bunch of people who had wholeheartedly bought from me in the past wholeheartedly moved on to another to do business, um, I would not be offended because I know about how business works. That is, that it depends on however a person wholeheartedly buys things. Even if it is close relatives or anyone, if they buy over there, a business owner cannot get upset because it is hard to save up money. People who come to the stores to use their money think the same thing. They think that they must buy wherever it is the cheapest, just like a, a business owner does. This response was typical of interviews in Backlang, and the way it stated that one needed to separate business and family ritual, and how it stated notions of how an individual is driven to make decisions based on maximizing personal profit. In general, these vendors seem to take the urban vendor's view a step further, um, giving, less giving even less leeway to the uncle. Um, though not explic stated explicitly, an awareness of the concepts of concepts such as Adam Smith's invisible hand seemed implicit in the responses of owners in the village. To them, Ball was just acting the way that forces beyond his control caused him to move, while the uncle was narrow-minded and not understanding this, and misled in not helping his nephew. Submitting to an idea to an idea of unsolvable market forces that cause one to maximize profits uh, may allow this change to happen um, in views of family structures. In this light, what I saw in the beginning as dishonest business from Zia, the vegetable merchant, um, you know, per perhaps something was going on differently than, than I originally perceived. Perhaps her understanding was that market pressure will cause one to do anything to maximize personal profit and enabled her to feel justified in her transactions, even if they included taking money from those traditionally closest to herself. It will be interesting to examine the future of Hmong social ethics as the village continues to develop. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's see, I need the audio too. Okay, okay so uh, let's see. Sorry. All right, so uh, perhaps just a really quick introduction. So Rachel's uh, actually in Ohio, right? I'm in Ohio. Okay, so hence the Skyping in, but we've got her up there, so you're on. Yes, thanks, Jacob, for making this circumstance work out. So for my research, I approached it wanting to know what the relationship was between a hospital being in very close proximity to a village, what the effects were on birth. And as I researched and looked into it, I realized that what would be more important was to see the effects of medicalization on the burial of the placenta, that ritual. So what this ritual is, is those that practice that the shamanism, there are two parts to the placenta ritual. First, there's the portion where it's right after birth. They bury the placenta. For the boys, it's under the center post, and for the girls, it's under the bed. 
The reason for the center post is that it's the spiritual center for the house. The home is very important in this, in, in their beliefs. And so by burying it right after birth, it helps the child to be healthier, to be strong, to not spit up. And also after the child's life is over, when the child dies, there is a showing the way ceremony where the shaman will actually take the spirit and lead it all the way back to the home where the placenta was buried. And this is so that the child or the individual can put on the birth shirt, which is what Lucha Manua means. It's the same word for birth shirt and placenta. And so they'll put on this birth shirt, and finally, after that, they can rejoin their ancestors in the spirit world. And so to find out what was going on with the placenta burial in the small village, I went to the I went to the source. I went to talk to pregnant women. We would see people in the village and be like, hey, there's a pregnant woman, we should go talk to her. And so I went and I talked to some of these women and I asked them, so where are you gonna give birth? Where are you gonna, are you gonna bury your placenta? And the first few women told me very matter of factly that I'm going to have my child in the hospital and I'm not going to bury the placenta. And I was like, what? What's going on? Don't you know how important it is to bury the placenta? And so this tension that I felt was an important driving force um, to find out what was going on here and why the reaction was different than I had anticipated. Than I had anticipated. Um, and medicalization, as defined by Irving Zola in the 1980s, is a process whereby more and more of everyday life has come under medical dominion, influence, and supervision. And in this case, that was really clear. There were other than a hospital being very close, right next to the nearest 7-Eleven, um, there was also a clinic inside the village. And it had a ward that was dedicated just to pregnant women, to women who had just recently become unpregnant. Um, and, and in that clinic, there were prenatals then every month, sometimes more frequently. And also a nurse from that clinic would go and make house visits to talk about nutrition and about vaccines, uh, talking to mothers about these things. I also got to attend a sex ed class in Thai where they talked very explicitly about contraception. And this was curriculum sent down from the Thai government because Thailand is one of the, has one of the highest rates of teen pregnancies in Asia. And I'm very aware of this statistic and I'm very conscious in wanting to uh, do away with that statistic had that not been the case. And that goes on for their movement development goals that Thailand has been actually praised for how well they've carried out these goals of decreasing child mortality and having increased number of skilled birth attendants. And Thailand has also um, established policies so that your first two children, if you have them at the hospital, they are completely free. You pay nothing under the healthcare system. But every child after that, you start charging. And it's more for every child that you have. And so a lot of these demonstrations of medicalization in this village that I saw seemed very closely tied to a Thai national agenda of assimilation of these Hill Tribe, uh, these Hill Tribe ethnic minorities. And in fact, one of the men who did bury his, his children's placenta and brought it home from the hospital, he said, the younger generation now, they don't know about the modern traditions that were set by ancestors. They learn the new traditions and use the Thai traditions. They go to school and grew up going to school, so they use it according to Thai. And there is there is an awareness of, of the influence of, of Thai culture on these on the Hmong families. And similar, a, a fellow researcher who was there with us, she's Hmong American, and she told me a story about how one day <clears throat> she came home from school and saw her mom was washing dishes in cold water. And she was like, Mom. What are you doing? Like, you're supposed to use hot water. And her mom was like, no, I've always washed the dishes in cold water. She said, no, it's cleaner. Mom, you have to use hot water. And so that story is a good example of, of some of the authority that's lost, um, the, the tradition, the authority of the Hmong traditions, that, that authority is being lost as there's more interaction between Hmong and Thai traditions. And, and in this case, in the research that I was doing, this hot water was the location of the birth. That was the primary, um, the primary effect of medicalization was on the location of the birth. Instead of occurring at home, it happened at the hospital. 
and and that variable was most influential on whether the placenta was buried or not. If the birth happened at home, a majority of the cases, the placenta was buried. If the birth happened at the hospital, majority of the cases, the placenta was not buried. So that location change was very influential on the placenta burial. And, and so that affected a change in practice. The other half of the change in practice was the ritual, the showing of the way ritual at the funeral was changed. Instead of saying go back to the home where your placenta was buried, they would say go back to the hospital or go to the Thai to find your placenta. And this change in practice resulted in a post hoc change in ideology that I found. That it wasn't just the rituals that were changing, but as a result of these ritual changes, the ideology itself was changing. The cultural models that these people held on to were also changing. And, and it was said very well by um, a young man in the village and his grandmother. The first quote is from the young man, and he said, It's like Hmong had been living with the map, the type. And they are all mixed together. So Hmong traditions are gradually disappearing and becoming theirs. That's what Thai do. Individuals at this time don't really do the same as those in the past, you know? Those people in the past, the old people, they'd say like, the tradition is this, but now the children don't really, don't really know Hmong traditions from the past. We live with the Thai, and so we've made the Thai traditions our own. And his grandmother responded by saying, Hmong tradition, from the past has fallen far. There is no Hmong traditions from the past. There isn't any. They have completely fallen. It's a new tradition. They follow the new tradition. And so the effects of medicalization, other than changing the location of the birth and changing the ritual practice, has also started this creation of a new tradition. It's not complete, but it's changing to a reprioritization of convenience over tradition. There is a generational disassociation and a loss of faith in the power of the ritual. And there's also an arousal of faith in biomedicine and modernity. And in fact, this new generation is using biomedicine to exert and increase their own agency and, and to create a new kind of hybrid of, um, <laughs> of what really matters and what and what will matter in the future for this for this new tradition. Thank you. Sorry, that said two minutes, not time up. I realize you probably can see that, but <laughs> whatever, you're good. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll, uh, let me, I'm gonna unplug you from the speaker, Rachel. Okay. And set you over here so you can see Charles on this side over here. And we'll uh, turn it over to Charles Knuckles, our discussant for this panel. Well, thank you all very much for some most excellent presentations. I enjoyed them uh, tremendously. And I think it is a testimony not only to your hard work, but the care and attention given to your write-up by your mentors that your presentations today were as excellent as they were. Keep up the good work. Um, let me uh, proceed through these in, in, in order. <laughs> that might be the best way. And consider, first of all, uh, Krista's paper. Uh, which I take to be an, uh, an exposition of, uh, of creation mythology and in how that uh, mythology is used to signify characteristics of identity. Um, the um, version of the paper that I'm working for is, of course, the one that I was sent electronically, not the one that was given orally. Uh, there are differences between the two, and uh, that's to be expected. As one develops these papers, naturally they change from day to day, even moment to moment. Uh, and what I noticed in the oral presentation was, a, was an enhancement, an improvement, and uh, that, is, uh, that is a good thing. The um, mythology can be used to, uh, 
to charter one's existence, to explain one's place in the world. Um, and that can be used to um, uh, explain why one's predicament is, is difficult, like these myths do, by calling attention to various errors that have been made in the mythic past. We are how where we are because our ancestors made mistakes. Um, and maybe, uh, as, the, as Krista suggests, in order to move beyond, beyond that, to repair one's position in society by, by suggesting that the uh, warrant of mythology now points in another direction toward a happy or more pleasant future condition, not merely the repetition of past states that, have, that are much more problematic. And I think there's considerable truth in that. Uh, this, is, this kind of work has been done by anthropologists for a long time. I think in particular of the 10 volume uh, uh, collection by uh, Thurston called Castes and Tribes of Southern India. Castes and Tribes of Southern India is a, is a huge work that, that uh, collects the mythology of various caste groups in South India. Uh, as these uh, configure current statements about identity. And usually they begin not, not like this group, but uh, in the opposite manner of suggesting that we were once much greater than we are now. We have fallen into the condition we now occupy. And, uh, and that's not our fault. That's the fault of circumstances. The myths that Krista recounts are opposite to that, saying that errors were made by our ancestors, but we have now decided to transcend them. My question is, um, is that really so? Um, that is to say that uh, one, one purpose of, of these myths might be to lay out a case for Hmong exceptionalism and to suggest that uh, their rather rascally mythological past in fact, it explains some of the more charming characteristics of their own character. I mean, to themselves, it explains that. Um, it isn't necessarily a mark of illegitimacy, in other words, that the traditional mythology calls attention to error, mistake, and transgression before the instructions of a supreme deity. They could equally serve the opposite purpose to suggest that the, the more mischievous nature of the Hmong is precisely what gives them their special identity, something to pre be preserved, in other words, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a dam or protection against assimilation to the Thai majority. The paper that was presented gives us no reason not to, th not to entertain the hypothesis. It may well be wrong. I don't deny that. But the information as presented doesn't give us any basis on which to reject it out of hand. It could be true. And I would suggest the anthropological literature provides ample points of comparison to suggest that it could be here as well. So I would urge uh, Krishna to consider the possibility that uh, uh, that could be the case here as well. To moving on to uh, Field's paper, which I found in oral presentation considerably more engaging than the written form, which was, after all, only two and a half pages long in the version that I received. You went considerably beyond that in the oral presentation and all to the good, if I may say. It's always a question, I think, in writing a paper of this kind, whether or not it's rhetorically effective to begin with a straw man. That's the way a lot of us write, and so I suppose the answer is generally yes. Your straw man is Robbins. You present his view in caricature only to depart from it significantly and suggest that it does not apply. That's well and good, but one must recognize that there are plenty of other people out there doing conversion theory who start from a position much more in keeping with the one you describe as legitimate. One thinks immediately of the work of Rodney Stark, for example, the, uh, the sociologist who, uh, among other things, is well known as a, as a, as a sociologist of Mormonism. But one of the things he's written about even more is the, um, is the social dynamics of conversion. And in his, uh, in his work, he says that it is, the, it, is the, uh, it is the nature of a successful conversion process to result not in a, uh, in a condition too much uh, different from the one previously occupied. If you're too different, after all, you run the risk of being killed off by the surrounding population, you're just too different. 
But on the other hand, if you're not different enough, it sets you up for possible reassimilation to the to the uh, sponsoring population, the population that surrounds you. Every successful convert religion somehow manages to uh, uh, negotiate a, a path between these two, not too much, not too little. Shall we call it then the Goldilocks phenomenon within conversion narratives? I just made that up, by the way, just on the spot. <laughs> um, now, in your case, of course, you're arguing for continuity, and that's not surprising. <coughs> a lot of the uh, literature on religious syncretism has emphasized this, plenty in Rodney Stark's book, but also, of course, in, in Mexico and Mesoamerica, this theme has been has been uh, dealt with time and time again. And you may be well right, but there are reasons for not knowing for sure if you are, and I will cite two of those. Number one, you make the point that it is m chiefly in the nature of ontological assumptions that the continuity between past and present is to be seen. Yet this is a term that you do not even once bother to define. I would suggest to you that, that to convince the audience it may be necessary to do so. In fact, I noticed in the oral presentation of your paper, you slipped between two terms, ideology and ontology, suggesting to me at least that you do not actually distinguish between the two. And yet, if you want to use the word ontology, you should, you should do so. It usually signifies a theory of origins or how something comes into being or develops. That may be what you're talking about here. Um, but uh, it is not necessarily a statement of, of ontology that someone uh, uh, chooses to uh, refer to uh, 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 spirits and the departure of spirit from the soul in characterizing the efficacy of Christian prayer. That may or may not be an ontological statement. To know if it is, we would have to know more about the native conception of how things come into being, I would suggest. Uh, so I liked I liked this paper, but I think it would be stronger if you spent more time characterizing the nature of your chief of your principal vocabulary items. Um, now on to April's paper, which of course I also liked. Um, April speaks in terms familiar in anthropology over the last twenty years. Uh, almost catechistic, in fact, in their, in their, uh, in their uh, import, and I speak, of course, of words like renegotiation and repositioning. Um, her point is that um, memories, the narrative recounting of memory concerning past wrongdoing, is a way in which. Hmong renegotiate their position, presumably to a higher and more equal one uh, with respect to the surrounding society. But I would suggest to April that we have absolutely no way to know from her oral account if that is the case, because the Thai partners in this renegotiation process remain absolutely and totally silent. We do not know if they are present. We do not know what they say. In fact, all of the accounts she gives are oral presentations directed at her. Therefore, if any position is being renegotiated, it is the one that exists between you as the ethnographer and the informant. And that, of course, is an interesting point. Perhaps they intend you to serve as the, as the means of conveyance of their newly discovered importance. Maybe you are meant to be the emissary to the surrounding Thai society and convey on their behalf exactly how great they are. But again, that's something that I have no way of knowing from the account that you give. And so I would suggest to you that the use of the term renegotiate may well be true, but there is an insufficient basis in your paper for deciding the matter. So in your revision, if you have evidence to that effect, that the renegotiation is actually taking place between two parties and not just within the mind of a single individual, then I would suggest that that would be worth your while to present in the, in the longer version of this. I like the use of, of linguistic uh, evidence here. I like the fact that you're using um, real discourse. I think that's a level of particularity that we have every reason to celebrate in, uh, in, uh, in your work. The uh, fourth paper by Richard uh, I liked, uh, as I did all of them. Um, um, I didn't quite understand it, however, uh, to the degree that I think I would 
preferred. Um, is it the case that people who participate in the, in the market economy more so than anything else, is it the case that they adopt what you call a universalistic moral framework, which I take to mean simply a belief that everyone is available to be exploited equally. I, I will not discriminate it to the extent to which I will uh, do that to other people. Uh, that's an interesting uh, point. It may well be true. Uh, and is the opposite also to be consi considered the case in the, in the rural areas, that, uh, that their matters of kinship loom larger than mere considerations of profit and loss? Um, I don't know. I mean, that seems to be one of the uh, outcomes of your paper, but why else might people uh, prefer the traditional morality in their own village? It might be because they are under greater scrutiny by their relatives. There is an element of social control here that operates somewhat independently of any moral suasion that may also be present. Um, in fact, you can't get away with these things as easy as as easy in a in a uh, in a village setting. So, uh, I'm not sure. I I think that paper needs to be re uh, written. Some of the material is quite good, but uh, it isn't clear to me that uh, what you're characterizing is in fact a difference in moral outlooks. It may simply be the presence and absence of a certain kind of social control. Not that the two are distinct, but they are analytically uh, differentiable. The final paper on placentas, I did not get the, uh, I didn't get the written version. I don't know if you sent it to me, but I, I didn't get it. So this is the first time I've heard it, and so uh, I'm not, I don't have as quite as much to say. Of course, I liked it. The notion that, uh, that, that, that medicalization and uh, urbanization go hand in hand, that's uh, a fairly uh, widely accepted uh, assumption in medical anthropology. It doesn't surprise us because we see it everywhere and with respect to almost everything that was once traditional and has now been set aside in preference for the biomedical world that one finds in the urban milieu. What is interesting uh, to me is that this particular form of medicalization centers on reproductive issues. And I would uh, suggest to you the possibility that in most cases, that's the, that's the area le most impervious. That's the area usually most impervious to medicalization, at least in, in, in my experience. Um, has there been a trajectory that has led to this point in, the, in, the, uh, in, in what you describe as the medicalization of birth? Have other things dropped out along the way first and most importantly, and then only later at the end of the process has the placenta ritual itself been dispensed with? I might be wrong here, but I would suggest it, it is that, that the last thing people give up in the process of assimilation to, to urban medicalization is the practice associated with, with birth. And I think here in particular of the case of some Chicago informants I had years ago, very, very westernized, very, very into biomedicine. And yet uh, the woman of the household whom I interviewed, a nuclear physicist by occupation, refused to uh, feed her husband mango pickle during her menstrual periods. Now she had dispensed with virtually all other elements of Hindu practice, the worship of the gods, the use of particular ritual forms, those had all gone by the board. But in this one area, feeding her husband mango pickle, she remained absolutely and completely traditional. Why? Well, I asked her that question and she said, because it has to do with reproduction, it could affect his sperm, she said. Now, there was no, she didn't say that was for biomedical reasons. She said, this is part of the tradition. And she said, I simply can't afford to take the chance that anything I do could interfere with our future reproductive success. It was like the layers of an onion. Many of them can be stripped off rather readily when it comes to the dynamics of assimilation, but the innermost layer of that onion, in many cases, is the one most closely connected to reproductive issues. The fact that it has gone so far, in this case, suggests to me a preceding process in which other elements have been stripped out first. But I would, of course, defer to you in, in, in assessing whether or not that hypothesis has any uh, weight to it. But I enjoyed that very much. I enjoyed all of them. I salute you, and I see that my time is out. Thank you very much.
So I'm going to turn Rachel around here, and we'll start with John. So we've got about uh, we've got about eight minutes. Uh, then we can have a slightly shorter break. Uh, but yeah, eight minutes for questions, Rachel, comments. Rachel, can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, in following up on Charles's comment. Um, Presumably, in the hospital, the placenta is burned and treated as medical waste? Yes. And, or can it be wrapped up in a package and, and given sort of uh, in a, I don't know, a, a Chinese takeout box to the, um, to, the, uh, to the mother? So in the they, end, they're yes. not able to get a hold of their own placenta. They can ask for it. They said if you ask, yeah, the hospital official policy is that you can ask. But if you don't think to ask beforehand, they'll have already destroyed it. Okay. The presenters can also respond to the discussion if they want to. That's your that's your point, right? I mean, there's ample yeah. Southeast Asianist literature to okay. sort of support the dynamic that she's sort of situ almost taking for granted. But I think your point is a, a good one to say: is this only happening mm -hmm. when they're talking to you? That that mom doing this? Or yeah. yeah. So okay. is it re represent? I I think you're you're asking for evidence of a larger. Well, in uh, order for something to be negotiated, there have to be two partners. Well, somebody could attempt to unsuccessfully, <coughs> unsuccessfully attempt to, to renegotiate that. To it yeah. But it, but it still stands this, that this is a bid to, she, they're talking to you, so it is a bid to renegotiate. So, you, you know, you can play with the languages a little bit there. If you say a bid to renegotiate, that's what you're describing. And then in the, in the paper itself, you can sort of expand on to what extent this seems to be, you know, uh, evident of something larger or whether or not, maybe it is just. assumptions made about them as necessarily negative. They're called thieves and drug pushers and so forth. Could it be the case that some Hmong actually revel in those in those uh, in those assumptions? Yeah, we're a bit we're a bit edgy, you know. We're like that. You can't necessarily trust us. We're not predictable like, like all these boring people. Of course we identify with them, they identify with us. The honor their objective is, to, <laughs> is, to, is, to, is to renegotiate all of this to a position of equality. Is that really their goal? I could respond to that, but we're not here to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's in a, in, almost in a nutshell, and I know you sort of have an affinity to that, but that's something like uh, Jim Scott's argument about not just Hmong, but all Highlanders in Southeast Asia above 300 meters in elevation. And I think it's incredibly problematic. Um, but and it is a possibility. Oh, sure, it's a, yeah, well, yeah, it's a logical possibility, yes. An empirical one is, I would question it on empirical grounds. 
I think there are important ways in which Hmong distinguish themselves. So their their ethnic uni uniqueness is important, but it doesn't map on to the types of things that I think she's collecting in, in their narratives of representing negative representations of Hmong. It's sometimes just as a rhetorical strategy, and I don't want to reduce this to a, this kind of rhetorical strategy, but if you don't have the data to deal with some of these problems, you can't go back and do your field work. It may help simply to acknowledge that another type of interpretation is possible, yeah. but you're going in this direction. Um, because otherwise, you do leave yourself open to yeah. um, Which in the end makes your version of it more believable because they know that you've thought through some of the alternatives. That's a good point. I think for all the students. You know, students can ask questions too. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I think for everybody, though, it is helpful to remember that uh, nothing that we ever say is final position or is right or is the whole story and it's a, it, it's a great conversation out there and all we really need to do is contribute to the conversation in such a way that someone can pick up either from our errors or from the new platform to do something more and it, they can only figure out the platform if you tell them what its limitations are. And, uh, and then someone can go and start from there and improve on it. And you've made your contribution. Some of this, too, has to do with how you word your position. You don't want to be wishy-washy in stating you know, what your claims are and your support on the one hand. On the other hand, you don't want to overstate them to the extent that uh, you have the final answer, the only interpretation, the mm -hmm. ABC. And I'm, I'm speaking to both my comments. Um, then you have to find a balance between those two. I have a hard time believing that none of the students have something to say, especially since I know some of you have done a rather deep reading of Solomon's. <laughs> 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 there has been a lot of Solomon's <laughs> material on the table here, but not putting anybody on the spot. <laughs> All right, well, let's break for, uh, let's take a break, and you can ask those questions privately. Uh, the next panel is supposed to start at 3.20. We can take maybe a six or seven minute break. One of those papers dropped out, so we have a bit, a bit of extra time. There's only, there's only one paper? Uh, it's two papers. Sorry, uh, the new schedule that you have has two papers on it, and both of those are here, right? Oh. Uh, Harley and Janessa. Oh, no, there you go. Yeah, so let's take, uh, let's say six minutes and you two can set up. Yeah. Um, so this is our, our third and final panel for the day. This has been a great symposium. We're excited to hear from the last two uh, papers by Carly Jenkins. Uh, Jay. I always want to throw that in, in there. <laughs> Carly Jenkins and uh, Janessa Sheffield, and then Greg Thompson uh, will be our discussant. So, you're on. Okay, so I did my work in central Utah, and in this picture you can see my case study is Ed on the horse, and he's a shepherder, 44 years old, um, and he's been herding in the U.S. for two contracts, and. Um, these men are non-immigrant guest workers, guest worker herders, and they come here on a special working visa that allows them to stay here for three years at a time. And so they leave their families um, in their native <coughs> country. Ed is from Peru, and other herders along this mountain range are um, there from other places in South America or Peru as well. And um, and so he's been here for two contracts, which means he's been here for six years. And he works herding sheep. And his story is just a case study for the many, for the other 
herders that are on, along this mountain and they all have similar stories. So my thesis is that the non-immigrant guest worker sheep herder in central Utah experiences alienation of the worker as outlined by Karl Marx. And, um, and in this, in the manuscript that I found, um, Marx had this separated into four kind of categories. And so I take my paper through that, that the product of labor is owned by another other than the laborer. Uh, two, that the product controls the laborer. Three, that status of the worker is more important than his status as a, uh, another human being. And four, that he develops an estrangement of man to man. And this is a close-up of Ed. Um, this is him inside of his living space, which is a sheep camp, which looks like, oh, no, no, that was wrong. <laughs> um, which is a small dwelling that all of them live in. Um, they live there alone. And you can, from this picture, you can kind of see um, how he lives. There's a calendar here, and on this calendar he has listed um, different sheep that may have run away. And then here is a cord that comes from his solar panel outside that gives him electricity to charge his cell phone. Um, and then before we came, he was enjoying some juice mix. I don't even know what that is, like tang or something. Kool-Aid. Um, Kool okay, it's Kool-Aid. <laughs> And then he has his elbow resting on his bed. And then right here is his kitchen space. So there's kitchen, eating area, slash sitting area, bed. And storage is underneath his bed. Um, so referring back to Karl Marx, the first uh, criteria for an alienation of the laborer is that um, the product of labor is owned by someone else. And the product of labor is actually sheep. It's not the dogs. But I only had a picture of a dog with a tag on it. <laughs> so that's why I have a dog. Um, <laughs> so every one of the dogs and the sheep are tagged with the owner's name and phone number. Um, and it's just to help you guys visually see that these migrant workers are not coming to the US to work on their own herds and sheep in the US. They're working for somebody else, and the sheep belong to somebody else. And even the land that the herder is working on is owned. Usually, it's either owned by the, um, by the, uh, the herder's boss or federally owned and managed by um, the Bureau of Land Management. Okay, secondly, the product controls the guest worker's schedule and location. So here you see the outside of Ed's sheep camp, and you can, um, if we even had it further away, you would see that he's not by anybody, he's not by anything. These guys are really difficult to find, and this is kind of a view of what they may see from their workspace. So this is civilization. Um, the valley down below, and um, it takes about an hour and a half to get to any of these guys when they're on the mountain. Um, and their schedule, so that's their location, their schedule begins around 5.30 a.m. They saddle up their horses and um, go down and wake up the sheep and bring them towards water, and then the sheep are there all day and then um, in the late afternoon, the herders go and herd the sheep again and bring them away from the water and up to the food where they can sleep for the night. And this happens every day. The herders are on call 24 seven and um, they're just there for the sheep. Um, and with this location, they are super remote and even though they do have the cell phone for emergency purposes and calling their family and stuff, um, they don't, they often don't have cell phone service. So that's a problem. Um, 
And another thing is if somebody does happen to pass by them, they only speak their native language of Spanish. And most of the people nearby, people from the valleys, which aren't really near at all, they speak English. And even the herders' bosses, the farmers, they only speak English. And they maybe know a few words like agua or um, really basic Burrito. Yeah. <laughs> food terms. <laughs> but they, watching them interact is an interesting thing in itself because they don't really um, they have a really difficult time using mostly hand gestures and then broken English and Spanish on both sides. Um, so Ed described his situation as alone, almost always alone. Um, since he's been working here, he's been separated from his wife and one child, and he's actually been working here for nine years. He claims that the work has made him shy and he now avoids contact with other people. He said that when he goes back to Peru, he stays with his, um, with his sister instead of his wife and child. And when he's asked to go into public events, he said, now it makes me nervous to go into office buildings or with groups of people. Perhaps from spending all of my time alone, that's what I've grown to like. I think the majority of people, shepherders, feel when they go back to Peru, they feel a little weird because they're used to being alone. Whenever there's a dancing party, I get nervous. Before, I would never get nervous, but now I do. And the status of worker is more important than his status as a fellow human being. Um, and here you can see there's some workers interacting with their boss, um, the white guy. And this is Ed in front of his camper. Um, and Loneliness of guest workers actually may be considered a benefit to the uh, farmers because lonely workers get are more likely to get satisfaction from the job and they're more likely to be better workers. Um, and as Marx pointed out, in modern industrial society, capitalist owners need a huge pool of movable workers, people with few ties beyond their immediate family and no claim to social privilege or status. Lastly, he experiences estrange estrangement from himself and others. Um, Marx said that the external character of labor for the worker appears in the fact that it is not his own, but someone else's that does not belong to him that in it he belongs and not himself but to another. It belongs to another, it is the loss of his, himself. Um, and so the worker is not as important as the human. It's the product of the labor, it's the sheep that, that he kind of lives for and that the farmers care about. They don't um, really care to get to know the herders as herders. Um, we can see this loss of self through our herders. They're lonely and succumb to the idea that their lives are ruled by another, their boss, the sheep, fed federal regulations, etc. The herder's family for whom he came to the US to provide, they um, care little for him and he has lost touch with them as well. Um, they stay here disillusioned on how long they will stay. He came here thinking that he would stay for one contract but ended up staying for nine years um, and separated from his family. And the separation and divorce rate among all of these herders, about 20 herders in all, um, was 50%. And this separation or divorce occurred while they were working in the US. And um, to conclude, I have a quote from one of Ed's acquaintances. And he said, I don't like the loneliness to walk all alone in the wilderness, but that's what we do. It's just what we do. And um, this just fits with Hegel's idea that the actual never fully captures the ideal and um, shows, kind of summarizes the concept that of the alienation of the worker. Time up, thank you.
Does anyone mind if I turn up the heat? Nope, go for it. Okay. Is this what makes it larger? Yeah. Okay. Hello, I'm Janessa Sheffield, and I did my ethnography on the homeless women of Salt Lake City, Utah. The title of my paper is uh, Women Gaining Identity and Creating Social Order Within Their Community. Throughout my paper, I am referencing Durkheim and his theory on social order and Baudir and his theory on habitus. Um, just a little background on Salt Lake. As you know, it is heavily populated by the LDS culture, um, and Salt Lake gets a lot of tourists for a couple reasons. It's main outdoor attractions and the religious connections to the LDS temple, the visiting center, conference center. And um, the shelter that I worked at got its fund, well, some of its funds from the church and other funds from organizations connected to the church. Um, and my first experience at the shelter I was introduced to a woman that I'll call Carol, and she talked to me about her experiences of becoming homeless and how it was important to develop status while she was on, um, on the streets. So that got me interested to know if this is true for all the other women, and um, I did find that that is true. And at this particular shelter, there are four groups that they categorize these women to um, be in, and that is the locals, the wanderers, the teens, and addicts. So throughout this presentation, I'll address those four groups and um, give a case study and how they are classified into this group. And just a side note, through IRB restrictions, I couldn't use um, my own photos, so the photos you'll see are from Google. Um, so I'll just go ahead with the first group. They're the locals. and. <laughs> They are chronically homeless, which means they've been living on the street for several years. Um, the locals live fairly permanent to the shelter, and um, they attend the shelter every single day for every meal that's provided. So they're very well known by the staff. And their main focus is um, collecting items off of the streets they have found in the gutters and making memories with them, which they refer to as treasures. Um, a quote from an employee at the staff said that the locals are the ones that do not use our living accommodations. They live on the streets or in government housing nearby, and they push grocery carts everywhere. The reason she refers to grocery carts is because the locals tend to have objects like a grocery cart or a, a large amount of bags where they carry all the items that they've picked up. It's very important that they keep these items with them at all times. Um, my case study I'll call Charlie. She uh, has been at the shelter for seven years, and when she's not at the shelter, you can find her in the same park on the same bench every single day. Um, and like most locals, she appears to have a mental health issue. Um, and I say this because when I talked to her and the other locals, it, it was hard to carry on a conversation because they would get distracted. And in her particular case, she'd go off on tangents about her experience in London and how the government stole her money. And so it just didn't really make sense when I was asking her how her day was or how her meal was. She would um, go back to, the, to these stories. Um, and when she was showing me some of the items in her grocery cart, one of the items that stuck out to me was a news article that she said she got several years ago in London when actually this news article was fairly recent at the time and it was a desert news article. So there is evidence of fabrication which is not uncommon um, between the locals. Um, the next group are the wanderers and they are the opposite of the locals. So. You won't, you won't see them more than once at a shelter. They go from shelter to shelter to shelter. And they're in a cycle of being homeless. So they're homeless up to two to six weeks at a time. And that um, the reason they become homeless is due to eviction of substance abuse. So um, if they tend to 
spend their rent money on their their drugs or something which leads to them being evicted. Um, a quote from an employee at the staff said, you can tell which ones are the wanderers because you'll never see them again. They move from shelter to shelter. So just like I stated, they drift from each shelter. My case study is Angie. She has been wandering since she was 13. And when I met her, she was in her 40s. Um, during her time on the street, she gave birth to two boys and raised them on the street who are currently now all grown up and wandering on the street as well. Um, Angie and the other wanderers are not so much focused on their long-term lifestyle, but just day to day. They're focused on which shelter is gonna meet their needs as far as a meal or a place to, to stay that, that day. Um, the third group are referred to as the teens, and they are young women that are runaways from either foster care or an abusive situation at home. Um, and these young girls, they reside at the shelter and they work alongside of the volunteers cooking or, or cleaning. Um, they have a more extreme appearance compared to the others. And what I mean by that is discolored hair, tattoos, piercings, just um, more extreme. Um, a quote from the staff said, the teens generally come from abusive homes. They suffer from abandonment, so they have a tough time trusting adults, well, people in general for that matter. And um, I definitely saw evidence of that. I, I volunteered a lot at the shelter, so I spent time beside them. And you can see how they, they are very independent. And if they need help for something, they won't ask. They'll just do what they can to figure it out because they don't want to feel like they owe you something for helping them, which I talk in my paper about. Um, my case study is Bailey. She's 14, and she ran away from an abusive home. Her appearance was a little less extreme than the other. She did have tattoos and piercings, um, but that was about the, ex the extent of it. Um, she's involved in a few programs at the shelter. She is taking weekly counseling um, to help her self-esteem and to um, let people into her life, let, let her know that people can help her and trust her without getting anything back. Um, and she's also involved in a program that's helping her get her GED so that she can graduate high school. The final group I'm going to address are the addicts. And in this community, an addict is defined as someone who is progressing. So out of the four groups, they're the ones that are putting forth effort to get off of the street and live a more sustainable, successful life. And um, of the addicts I talked to, at one point in time, they all were homeless, but at this state were, um, um, sorry, th through the housing department and job placement, they were able to get a, get a place to live and a job and be able to move forward. Um, if, they were, if they were in between living arrangements, they could reside at the shelter alongside of where the teens lived. Um, so the addicts go to the shelter for the programs that are provided. So the, they provide a 12-step program for um, addictions, um, support groups for women in abusive situations, and the GED and housing departments that I talked about earlier. And of the four groups, they, their appearance is, is the one that's most updated. They have styled, styled hair, makeup. They're the only ones that I saw that wore jewelry and so they're a little more presentable in, in that way. And when I talked to an addict and asked if she was going to come to the meal um, that was being served after the program that she was attending, she said, me and the other ladies feel like if we did, then we wouldn't be true to ourselves and how far we have come. It'd be like taking a step back. We would rather provide for ourselves now that we can. So it's very important now that they've reached this point where they're no longer homeless, that they don't depend on the shelter for meals or anything. Um, my case study is Mandy. She came to Utah to go to college and she got involved in drugs and got pregnant, had an abortion, and because of that she was disowned by her family which led to her homelessness. And she came to the shelter because um, she was in an abusive relationship and she's now attending the 12-step program and the support group. 
for the women. And um, she is, at the time when I talked to her, she was moving into her new apartment in t two weeks, and she was starting her new job in three days waitressing. Um, if I had more time, I'd want to talk about how these women can evolve in between groups. Um, but I'll just close by saying that I really enjoyed my time there and serving these women. Um, my hopes that uh, through my paper that my audience can have a better understanding of where these women come from and that society is important to them, even though they don't necessarily fit into our society because of the social norms. It was important for them to create their own society because they have a sense of belonging. So, thank you. Uh, so, uh, first off, I, I want to say what a great forum this is. I hope you guys uh, appreciate that this is, I, I, the thing I love most about it is the way the, uh, the student becomes the teacher and the teacher becomes a student. So, we sit down and listen to you guys talk and I think that's really uh, good pedagogy anytime that can happen. Um, a second, I'd mention uh, uh, just John's point about uh, documenting practices. I think. Um, not just not just what people say, but what people do. So for those students that are um, uh, uh, not yet in the field, uh, it's a great reminder just to to realize how important that is to document that part of it. I think you get a little nervous when you're doing it because you think like, oh, well, this is just one little story and it doesn't represent things. Uh, but what what I always argue, and I've shown some of my students the picture of the hologram is this idea that you, you can find the universal in the particular. And so you start with the particular, you tell an interesting story about it, and in doing so, you suddenly realize, oh, you gotta explain this, you gotta explain that, which relates to another story and another thing. Uh, and it's, well, this reference may go past you, but uh, it's like the, uh, the diary of Tristram, Tristram Shandy, uh, where he starts telling a story about his life and he can't even get through a day of his life. It takes him a whole year to tell a, a story of the day of his life. Um, so you'll feel that way when you're doing your research. This is for you students that are pre-field. Um, uh, so uh, thanks to both uh, Janessa and Carly for sharing their papers. With uh, Carly, I got a longer paper. Janessa, I have a longer PowerPoint. Uh, it gave me a little more, uh, and I've seen her work uh, before. Uh, and for thanks for the long hours you guys put into doing your field work. Um, it, and I, I don't wanted to mention also what a unique opportunity it really is for students here to do field work. Uh, I always mention this because coming from elsewhere, this is really a striking thing that you guys do here, and it, and it bears acknowledging. Um, uh, I, I sometimes fear my students don't always understand how valuable it is going forward. I hear a lot of students lament, but what, do you, what can you do with an anth anthropology degree? Yeah, some people may be feeling that right now. Uh, and the answer is anything. You can really do anything. It's, as uh, Malinowski says, I'm paraphrasing here, the science of humans, right? It's a human social science that is best. Um, and you, you know we don't have some cookie cutter approach that gives you a rubric or recipe to follow and go do this in the field uh, in order to figure out how the natives really think, whatever, whoever the natives may be, they may be us. Uh, instead, anthropology throws you into the world and it leaves you to figure out what is going on. And it's precisely that skill of figuring out what is going on that is needed in this world more than ever. So here I'm going to make the pitch to your uh, pocketbooks, I guess. Uh, according to a recent survey, employers nowadays more than ever are expressing a desperate need for college graduates who are able to take on projects, work with others, and to work independently and think critically and creatively. This is what we do in anthropology, all right? Uh, and this is what you students have done. And so you should be very proud of your work. Uh, and because of the nature of their products, projects, I think Carly and Janessa experienced this sense of being thrown into uh, the world of their field site as much, if not more, than others. Uh, uh, notwithstanding Dr. Hawkins' strong guidance and support, which was, I'm sure, quite considerable and valuable, he was nonetheless not there in the field with them. They were totally on their own in the field. Uh, there were no other students in their field sites with them, and their only connection with John was by email. So I mention this simply to recognize the remarkable effort that went into carrying out the field work itself. So congratulations to both of you for having accomplished that impressive task of doing field work. 
So as for the content of the papers, I think both papers reveal to us people that are normally hidden away from society or from whom we in mainstream society tend to hide. Uh, Janessa gives us a portrait of the homeless living in Salt Lake City and for whom it might be said that we in mainstream American society figuratively, if not literally, turn our backs on. Uh, Carly presents us with a small group of seasonal immigrant agricultural workers doing the very tough and social, uh, socially isolating work of sheep herding. So I'll start with uh, Janessa's project. So Janessa provides an interesting description of the cast of characters that one might encounter in a homeless shelter. Uh, as for the point of the project, I, I think you kind of got to it at the end, I see it less as about homeless, homeless women, quote, gaining identity or, quote, creating order. Uh, this, is, this may sound like simply a matter of wording, but I think it's an important one. Uh, as currently phrased, it sounds like they're kind of explicitly and intentionally bringing these categories into existence. And in reality, I think that the way it works is typically these categories kind of emerge out of the things that people do. Um, just they emerge on the social scene. They, um, they aren't uh, intentionally made. They just kind of happen as people go about their lives and certain categories fall out of life as being more apt for describing the social scene. So I, I see your project is very useful uh, in pointing out to us the ones who typically uh, choose not to see the homeless and how our categories of homeless and well, uh, not homeless, whatever the opposite of homeless, would, whatever we want to pose that to, how those simple categories fail to capture the diversity within the category of the homeless. So I think your project's a nice corrective to this, and the categories that you offer further demonstrate to us the nature of these women's experiences as actively, per, for example, as actively pursuing steps to recover from abusive relationships or from addictive behavior. So as I've mentioned before, I'd be interested in hearing more about how the various categories relate to one another. Um, you know, when they're all in a room together, how is it that the literal physical space is broken up or not by these various categories that you describe? Uh, and then, of course, over time, is there movement between these categories? So I think, uh, Janessa, I think you're aware that the connections to theory are, uh, need a, a lot of work. Uh, in my opinion, they're, they remain really unconvincing at this point. Um, I think the, you mentioned the Bourdieu this time that I didn't see in the, in the stuff before. Uh, and I think uh, there'd, be, it'd be some, there'd be some interesting things to pursue there in terms of um, thinking about uh, habitus as Bourdieu defines it, uh, as a structured structure that structures structures. All right, did you all get that? That's one of my favorite, uh, so wonderfully clear, isn't it? Not at all. Uh, so, but if you look at that definition of habitus, it's uh, I think on page 79 of, uh, maybe 72 of uh, Outline of a Theory of Practice. Um, there's gr great stuff there where you can kind of uh, see if you can get a handle on that and then think about how is it that uh, the ca these categories, the, the habitus of these folks serve to structure the context. So that's where once you start to get describing the social space and how th these categories are, are brought into play in the social space, and then also how they talk about each other, right? Who says what about whom? And how is there, is there, are there hierarchies there? I'm better than this person because she's one of the, mm, whatever, the wanderers. Uh, or is there anything like that? What kind of, what does that space feel like? Um, how, do the, how do the categories relate to one another? That starts to get you into um, really understanding the structure and the social space that's going on there. Um, all right, so I'll turn, move on to Carly's project. So before becoming familiar with Carly's work, I had no idea that there were uh, Peruvian, Chilean, and Mexican sheep herders working in the valleys of central Utah. Who'd have guessed it? Uh, in her work, uh, Carly describes the lonely and alienated existence of these sheep herders as they spend the majority of their life away from their wives and family, uh, indeed from any contact with human beings just about. Uh, so Carly makes some interesting connections to Marx's notion of estranged labor, suggesting quite rightly, I think, that these sheep herders are engaged in a form of labor that is highly alienating. So a couple of questions to Carly. Uh, back over there. Uh, <laughs> some of these will be answerable, some of them are rhetorical, and you can decide if you want to deal with any of them. Uh, in your paper, you describe, uh, quote, a visit that Ed did not want. Um, that's some of the language you, you say 
uh, on a visit that Ed did not want. You, you asked him about stuff. And I was wondering if you could say more about that, uh, either now or another time. Because uh, it, it seems p peculiar that someone so isolated would not want a visitor. So there's maybe a, some simple explanation behind it, but uh, there might be something more there too. Uh, in the sheep herder statement of wanting just, uh, she, she gives, I don't know, I don't think it was in the, in the presentation here, but she says they, um, why they keep going back is they want a little bit more, a little bit more. Uh, and there one hears some interesting echoes of Marx's uh, go on, go on that's whispered in the ear of the capitalist um, that characterizes capitalism. Uh, and Marx uses those, the, the, you know, that phrase to describe how the capitalist is trapped by capitalism, unable to ever stop and take a breath for fear that the next guy over will take over their business. So what I'm particularly interested in is, uh, what I find think is particularly interesting is how Carly is documenting how these men are becoming pulled into an ideology of capitalism. Uh, and here it might be interesting to bring Weber in to flesh out uh, the nature of this a little bit. Um, how do they reconcile this push for a little bit more with their cultural values about family? Is, the, is their family pushing them for more as well? It seems like based on the high rates of divorce that you, you, and separation, that, that would suggest that their families are not very appreciative of the fact that they do this work, even if it does bring some money home. Um, so how do they address the fact that their families would rather have them home? Um, and you'll see here that I'm pushing the question of the role of their own agency of, of, in all of this, um, since you point out that they choose this path of their own free will. So this aspect of your data reminds me of Paul Willis's uh, learning to labor. All right. Uh, so let's just jump through. Um, I got lots more that we could talk about, but um, so finally, I'd say I'm I'm really fascinated by the example of Ed losing track of what day it is when you say uh, you know there's a festival and he says oh that's not now and you say no it it is uh, now and then he looks at the calendar and says oh it really is now. Uh, I think that, that um, and, I, and there I'd uh, point to E.P. Thompson's uh, Time, Work, and Discipline, which is a nice paper that looks at the way that time sort of structures life and this tra uh, at these moments of transition in history. And uh, I think you know, your example shows wonderfully how much his life was dominated by his work. Uh, in contrast to the well-known technique for getting to sleep, Ed's life was measured by the counting of sheep, right? Uh, and maybe that other sense of sheep counting is apt here because Carly's work suggests that Ed's, Ed lives a life much as Marx described the worker of his day in a kind of somnambulistic trance. And perhaps to say he is sleepwalking may be saying too much. At least the sleepwalkers can dream. So in closing, we might ask if Marx's take on capitalism is right, and if in capitalism life begins when work ends, then one wonders for these sheep herders, when does work end? So thank you.